Gertrude Tompkins was born in 1912 in Jersey City and raised in Summit, New Jersey, in Union County. She was the youngest of three daughters. Her father was an inventor who eventually became successful in the cement business. He encouraged his daughters, Margaret, Elizabeth, and Gertrude, to pursue their own intellectual pursuits. As a child, Gertrude was very shy and introverted, in part due to a stutter that her parents could find no therapy to cure. They were able to provide her with a diverse education and extensive life experiences throughout her young adulthood. She raised goats for a time, received an undergraduate degree in horticulture in Pennsylvania, and toured gardens throughout Europe. Gertrude was fluent in Italian and French, and was somehow able to speak both languages without her stutter. Gertrude eventually developed a passion for flying through a pilot she fell in love with in 1940. It was unusual at the time for women to be pilots, but the young man began teaching Gertrude how to fly when she would go flying with him, and she eventually obtained her pilot's license. The couple became engaged, but Gertrude's fiancé joined the Royal Air Force so as to fight in World War II before the United States entered it. He was killed when his plane was shot down over the English Channel. The death of her fiancé instilled a desire to help with the war effort in Gertrude. In September of 1942, a seemingly perfect opportunity arose for her to do so. As male pilots were being sent overseas, there was a shortage of them for military operations stateside. Therefore, the United States government began recruiting for the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, or WASP for short, program. The aim of the program was to use civilian female pilots for tasks like military aircraft transport and testing, so that male pilots could be sent into combat. Over 25,000 women applied for the program, and only 1,800 were accepted. Gertrude was one of them. Out of those 1,800, only 1,100 successfully completed the program's rigorous training. Gertrude's stutter should have caused her to fail her training, as clear radio communication was of paramount importance. She overcame that problem by singing her responses and commands over the radio. Like when she spoke a foreign language, she did not stutter when she sang. Gertrude finally overcame her stutter for good shortly thereafter, supposedly as soon as she flew a P-51D for the first time. She was one of only 126 members of her training class selected to fly fighter planes and attend advanced pursuit school in Brownsville, Texas. While she was initially assigned to fly the P-51D, she ultimately had the experience of flying a variety of fighter planes. On September 25, 1944, Gertrude married Henry Silver, a businessman from New York who was serving in the Army. Two days later, she returned to her assignment in California, where she did not disclose her marriage. The women in the program were preferred to be unmarried. Gertrude may have decided to get married when she did because Henry Silver was petitioning to adopt his orphaned niece at the time. He and Gertrude planned to make a home for the little girl at the end of the war. Gertrude did not discuss her marriage, use her married name, or wear her wedding ring in California. On October 26, 1944, at approximately 4 p.m., Gertrude took off from Mines Field, now a part of Los Angeles International Airport, piloting a brand new P-51D Mustang. She was to fly the plane to Newark, New Jersey. From there, the plane was going to be sent overseas. Gertrude was one of 40 pilots transporting planes that day. Gertrude, as well as two of the other pilots, were delayed due to problems with the canopies of their planes. Their flights for the day had to be cut short due to the delay, so they would just be flying to Palm Springs, California on this leg of the trip. Gertrude was the last to take off. She did not arrive in Palm Springs, but the other pilots assumed that there had been a further problem with her canopy and that she had gone back to Mines Field. The trip to Newark would have taken three days with numerous stops in perfect weather and under perfect conditions in the P-51D Mustang. Particularly in light of the initial problem with the plane's canopy, no one was surprised when Gertrude did not arrive in Newark after just three days. After five days, however, officials realized that she was missing. Since Gertrude never arrived at any other airport after taking off from Mines Field, it was assumed that she crashed shortly after her takeoff from there. The search for the site of her presumed crash has therefore largely focused on the Santa Monica Bay, just west of Mines Field. The military launched a search that lasted for a month, but no sign of Gertrude or her plane was ever found. Searches for Gertrude's plane have continued over the ensuing decades, 
aided by advances in technology. Such searches were made in 1999, 2001, and 2004. In October of 2009, a massive underwater search was conducted by a group of 35 experts who volunteered their services. They were particularly hopeful that this search would finally solve the mystery of Gertrude's disappearance so that they could finally provide answers to Gertrude's sister, Elizabeth Tompkins Whittall, who was 100 years old and living in Florida. Gertrude's plane was not found during the course of the week-long search. The search did, however, locate the wreckage of a T-33A jet that went missing in 1955, finally providing answers to the families of the two pilots who had been on board. Air Force Lieutenants Richard Martin Thieler and Paul Dale Smith. Elizabeth Tompkins Whittall passed away in 2010 at the age of 101. The Women Air Force Service Pilots Program was ended in December of 1944, as more male pilots were available for the tasks it had undertaken. The women who flew as pilots during it were not considered to be part of the armed forces and therefore were not entitled to any of the benefits or honors given to veterans. In the 1970s, many of them lobbied Congress for recognition of their service, and in 1977, they were finally given military status. In July of 2009, following a bipartisan effort in Congress, President Obama signed a bill awarding the Congressional Gold Medal to the women Air Force service pilots. Gertrude's presumably crashed plane has never been located, and her disappearance remains unsolved. Naomi Cheney was born on September 20th, 1918, in Jasper, Alabama. She graduated from high school in Pensacola, Florida, before continuing her studies at Florida State College for Women. She taught high school for one term after graduating from college in 1942, but then decided she wanted to be a part of the war effort. Naomi therefore enlisted in the Women's Army Corps and was sent to Fort Des Moines, where she entered officer school on April 26th, 1943. She received her officer's commission on June 5th. That September, she was transferred to the Technical School of the Army Air Force's Training Command in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. She arrived there on September 4th. On October 5th, 1943, Lieutenant Cheney had dinner at the base's officer's club. She then went to visit her roommate, who was in the hospital on the base. Lieutenant Cheney did not leave the base until 9 o'clock that evening, well after it had gotten dark. She and her roommate had just moved into a home at 525 South Euclid Avenue, two days earlier from another home in town. It was common practice for civilians to rent out rooms to board service members in their homes at the time, due to the rapid increase in personnel assigned to the base because of the war. Her walk home from the base should have taken her roughly 25 minutes. Lieutenant Cheney left the base through gate number three which opened onto what is today called Burnside Street, but at the time was Northwest, near its intersection with Western Avenue. Before leaving, she asked the guard at the gate if he thought she would be safe walking home in the dark. He told her she would have to use her own judgment. After weighing her options for a few minutes, Lieutenant Cheney left the base and began walking home. A cab driver would later report having seen her a short time later, just down the road, near the intersection of Northwest and 6th Street. The lieutenant did not report to the base the following morning and was classified as being absent without leave. Military police went to the home where she was staying to try to find her, but she was not there. They became concerned when Lieutenant Cheney could still not be found by that afternoon. Around 5 p.m. that day, a 10-year-old girl named Val Hall was out looking for sumac leaves in a wooded area not far from her home. She came across a woman lying motionless in the middle of a path in a thicket underneath a viaduct crossing the train tracks near 12th Street and Grange Avenue. The woman was Lieutenant Cheney, and she was deceased. Her autopsy would later estimate that she had died approximately 18 hours earlier. Her body was found less than three blocks from her home. Lieutenant Cheney's autopsy determined that she had died as a result of a crushing blow to the right side of her head, which had resulted in numerous skull fractures and brain hemorrhages. The exact location of her body made it impossible for her to have fallen or been thrown from the viaduct. She had not been sexually assaulted, and there was no evidence that such an assault was even attempted. Her uniform was intact and only slightly rumpled. One of her shoes was, however, scuffed and had its toe box crushed, as though someone had stomped on the lieutenant's foot. 
Her visor cap was found not far from her body, as was her purse, which still had cash inside of it, seemingly eliminating robbery as a potential motive in the crime. Two doctors did debate the nature of Lieutenant Cheney's death at the coroner's jury convened to evaluate it. Dr. Gerundo, an associate professor of pathology at the University of South Dakota, argued that the lieutenant had not been murdered and that her injuries had been caused by her skull being run over by a car. He claimed that his examination of her vocal cords showed that she had not screamed prior to her death and argued she would have screamed had she been attacked. Even if his examination was able to definitively prove that Lieutenant Cheney had not screamed, there is no way to prove that she had not been ambushed by a killer, which seems like a probable scenario, given the fact that her body showed few signs of a struggle and no signs that she had been restrained. Dr. Gerundo used these facts to instead further try to support his claim that no murder had occurred. The area where the lieutenant was found was not accessible by car. Dr. Gerundo argued that she had still been able to walk after sustaining the massive head injury. There was no reported blood evidence at the scene beyond the large pool underneath Lieutenant Cheney's head, meaning she would have had to make the long walk with a serious wound without dripping any blood on the ground or down her uniform, in Dr. Gerundo's scenario. Arguing that Lieutenant Cheney had been murdered was Dr. Erickson, a Sioux Falls surgeon who had assisted with her autopsy. He pointed out that if the lieutenant had been hit by a car, she would most likely have more extensive injuries and damage to her uniform. He also claimed that the head injury was too severe for her to have walked at all after sustaining it, much less to have walked to the area where she was found, so far away from anywhere accessible by car. His assessment of her injuries was that they were caused by the lieutenant's head either being struck with a blunt object or being stomped or kicked while she was on the ground. The jury was convinced by Dr. Erickson's testimony, and Lieutenant Cheney's death was officially ruled a homicide. On October 6th, authorities brought a suspect into custody as he was trying to leave town. The 31-year-old man, whose name has never been made public, had a wife and children in Iowa, but worked as a farmhand throughout the region. While in Sioux Falls, he had been staying at a cabin at Smith's Auto Court, not far from where Lieutenant Cheney's body had been found. He was brought in because authorities had discovered blood-matted hair near his cabin. When the suspect was questioned, he also had blood on his shoe. He theorized that the blood had gotten onto the shoe as he walked through grass that morning. However, the blood was on the top of the shoe, not on the sole. The FBI was able to determine that the blood from the suspect's shoe and matted hair was the same type as Lieutenant Cheney's blood but the technology of the time could not more conclusively tie the evidence to her. The suspect maintained his innocence and was released on October 27th, as authorities had no other evidence to implicate him in the murder. At the time, he was in the process of joining the army. After he enlisted, he was sent overseas and was killed in action. City and military police both worked on the case, traveling the country to conduct interviews and consulting with psychics Lieutenant Cheney had visited before her death. The Army offered a $1,000 reward in the case at the beginning of 1944, but none of these efforts brought resolution to the case. The murder of Lt. Cheney remains the oldest unsolved homicide in Sioux City. Gertrude Canning was born in County Donegal and lived with her family outside of Lifford. She shared her family's love of music and dancing and was described by those who knew her as happy and likable, with an adventurous spirit. She eventually left Ireland to work at various hotels in England. She was popular with her co-workers and customers. Following the outbreak of World War II, Gertrude joined the Women's Royal Naval Services. She was assigned to the HMS Quebec, a Navy base that was part of the number one combined training center on the shores of Loch Fyne, near the small town of Inverary, Scotland. The town had a population of less than 500 people, but between 1940 and 1944, almost a quarter of a million soldiers and personnel came through the area to work at the training center, with approximately 15,000 people there at any given time. Gertrude was able to use her previous experience working in the hospitality industry at the base, working in the officer's mess hall at the Admiralty House. On June 30th, 1942, 20-year-old Gertrude left the base, dressed in her uniform, to mail a letter to her father. She never returned. 
She was reported missing, and a massive search for her began. However, it would be two local boys who would finally resolve the search. They were gathering wildflowers near a local landmark known as the Marriage Tree, when they discovered Gertrude's body in a ditch in Inverary. Gertrude had been gagged with her own clothing, and four bullets were removed from her body. Three of the bullets had caused injuries that most likely would have killed Gertrude on their own. Examination of the bullets showed that they had been fired by a standard British Army 30 revolver, a weapon that thousands of men in the immediate area had been issued. Two roadmen reported seeing Gertrude on the 30th, as she was walking along a wooded track. They also reported that they saw a soldier walking in the same direction just a few moments later. Thousands of revolvers were test-fired, looking for a match to the bullets found in Gertrude's body. The weapons tested had been assigned to soldiers who were still at the training center, and to soldiers who had left it since Gertrude disappeared, and had been tracked down and brought back to the center for the testing. Despite the extensive testing, no match to the bullets that killed Gertrude was found. One of the investigators who worked on the case was Detective Inspector Robert Colhoun, out of Glasgow. Only a limited amount of information was released to the media at the time of the murder due to its connections to the training center, so much of what is known about the investigation comes from Calhoun's 1962 memoir, Life Begins at Midnight. In the book, he concludes that Gertrude was most likely murdered by a soldier she was familiar with, and that, in all probability, he died at Dieppe, and his secret died with him. The disastrous August 1942 raid on the German-occupied French port of Dieppe plays a part in more than one theory about the case and how the investigation was handled. Gertrude's murderer could, of course, ended up as one of the thousands of casualties at Dieppe. There has also been speculation that certain details about Gertrude's murder were kept quiet because the idea of a soldier committing a murder just outside of the combined training center would further destroy public morale around the war effort both before the raid occurred, when preparations were being made for it, and afterwards, when public confidence was on the decline. Journalist, author, and former Glasgow police officer R.J. Mitchell has raised concerns that Gertrude's killer may have been someone influential in the military, potentially even someone involved with the planning of the raid on Dieppe. During the course of his own investigation into the case, he learned from a military expert that the 38 revolver used in Gertrude's murder was only issued to non-commissioned officers and to officers with the rank of second lieutenant or higher. However, it has also been argued that someone with a lower rank could have still acquired one without having it formally issued to them, given how common they were. Another major problem Mitchell has identified with the investigation into Gertrude's murder is the underutilization of the two witnesses who saw Gertrude in the unidentified soldier on the day of her murder. According to Colhoun's account of the investigation in his memoir, there was no composite of the soldier produced. It wouldn't have been difficult to get descriptions and get an artist's impression, then compare this with the soldier's mugshots and see which branch of the service he came from, Mitchell argued in 2013. The minute I realized that fundamental aspect was missing from Colhoun's book, I thought, this isn't right, and it had the whiff of a cover-up. Despite the decades that have passed since her murder, Gertrude's family has remained committed to her and her story. Several of her nephews have been active in keeping her case in the media. One of those nephews, Liam Canning, has spent years researching his aunt's life and death in hopes of writing a book, and believes he may know the identity of a potential suspect. From what has been presented to the family, I could certainly identify who I think is a suspect, he told the BBC in 2012. Police in Scotland have said that if the case were to come before them now, they would solve it. The suspect has never been publicly identified, however, and the case is still unsolved. The Canning family says that their efforts have not been out of malice towards Gertrude's killer, and that they do not want revenge against him. Just justice for Gertrude. While so far they have not been able to definitively identify her killer, they have found other ways of showing respect for her and her memory. To mark the 70th anniversary of Gertrude's death, the family dedicated a plaque to her memory in Inverary.